So this morning, we're looking at 1 Timothy 3, and there's a couple of things that I've been really thankful for in my heart. I don't know for our church specifically. I'm thinking about that. There's a lot of stuff we should be thankful for. And, uh, but a couple of things that I thought that I am thankful for. If you remember a couple of months ago, we rolled out kind of the 2020 vision. God, would you allow us in the next three years, by the year 2020, would you allow us to see these dozen or so different things happening? And on that list that we rolled out a couple of months ago was that we wanted to see a paved driveway. Now, I did not expect, I was kind of working on that list several months before, kind of advanced planning, if you will. And I was thinking we were three years out from that, but I'm still shocked and amazed that we are as far along on the driveway. Now, the whole thing's not paved. I kind of envisioned kind of what we did, but a little bit more but we're ahead of schedule. It's not even close to 2020 and we're halfway there. I'm amazed at that. And that's a part of what we talked about in that 2020 is that we would see a re-equipped and a re-decorated building. And part of that in, in, in the paved driveway, because we know that our physical, our facilities needed some help, some TLC. But you know what God did that we did not at all see besides the driveway? He gave us a brand new drum set. And he has helped change the sound for our worship. We knew that we needed to do this. We've known it for years. Like our sound we know has been over the top. We've actually had really smart people come in here to kind of look at our building and tell us like, yeah, you got real sound issues here and uh, all kinds of things. But the drums that God gave us out of the blue, a ridiculously really nice expensive drum set that we would have never had the money to buy, God gave us to us for free from our friends from Graceway. God is answering the prayers on that sheet already. One, another, another target that we put on there asking God that within 2020 that we could actually average and see a, a, a one person a month that would put their faith in Jesus Christ, that they would be saved, and that they would follow through and be baptized as a testimony to their world that they are now a follower of Christ. Well, do you know something since November? That was nine months ago, November, December, January, February, March, April, May, June, July, nine months, right? Guess how many people we've seen baptized since November? Nine people. You didn't know about that list until a couple of months ago, but that had been something that I had been praying. You know, I'm just amazed at how God answers prayers. And God wants us sometimes to put things out there, targets, if you will, things that we should be asking him for and working towards not things that that james tells us you know you at, you have not because you don't ask and then when you ask you ask really with selfish motives you just you just want it for yourself but when we ask god and they're for motives to glorify him those are the prayers that he likes to answer well this morning there's a third thing that's on that list that if you remember from a couple of months ago that by 2020, we wanted to see multiple pastors in our church and wanted to see more servant leaders, people that we have kind of, that we've recognized and have developed and trained or are willing to serve God and kind of step up and just help us to lead, lead things forward. Because we all recognize not one person can do everything. I mean, it takes two, you know, it's hard on living single in your own life when you're working and juggling life and all of that, right? And how much more even in a, a church. And so this morning, as we look at 1 Timothy 3, Paul is writing to Timothy, and he's explaining to the church, explaining to Timothy what it means to have pastors and, and have overseers in the church, who they are, what their qualifications are, and that kind of thing. So this morning, we're going to be talking about what that looks like. And my prayer is, and my plans are tentatively before the Lord, when I come back from Mexico, which is in a couple of weeks, we need to start praying for that as a church. In fact, I'm going to put a little shout out there and ask you to put Mexico on one of those lines on that paper, all right? Pray for the people of Mexico, the Nahuatl people that we're going to, to minister and share with. But when I come back from Mexico in September, I want to take us through a season that we would ask God to identify and to surface those individuals that he would be calling or might be calling to help be those volunteer pastors in the church so we can start taking a step forward in that area. I'm amazed. God just keeps working through us and our little church and our families and what he's doing, and it's really exciting. So before I read God's word, pray with me, would you? God, I'm grateful that you hear prayers. And Lord, I'm talking and focusing on things collectively with us as a church that we know about. But Father, I recognize that in every single heart here this morning, there are needs. 
there are concerns, there are maybe some fears, uh, some things causing anxiety, uh, all kinds of things. And God, I pray that you, in the middle of those, that you would teach us that you are faithful, that you will never leave us, that you will never forsake us, that you indeed are able as we have already sung. God, we love you. We thank you that you love us. You sent your son Jesus to die for us and that you redeemed us from sin and death and the grave and from the enemy. And you put us together as a church. And God, I pray that we would have a better understanding of who we are as a church and the leaders that you call, the servant leaders that you call to lead us as a church, as your body. Lord, we want to pay attention to your word for our life today. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Read with me, if you would, in 1 Timothy chapter 3. The Bible says this, The saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, that, by the way, is code. I'll explain it in a minute. That's overseer, pastor, elder, somebody who serves in a role like me. He desires a noble or a good task, a good work. Therefore, an overseer must, must, this is not optional, this is not, it would be nice, this is not a job description where you're an HR representative trying to fill a vacancy. Well, these three things are non-negotiable. These other two things would be nice. We hope we could get somebody with those qualifications. No, he is saying every single one of these is a must, must be, first off, above reproach. In fact, he must be above reproach in every area. All the others begin to explain what that word, what he means by that. The husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach. Not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, and not a lover of money. He must manage his own household well, with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? He must not be a recent convert, not a new Christian in other words, and, uh, or he may become puffed up with conceit, prideful, and then fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders. Interesting, it doesn't just matter how, what we view of him, but what is that person, how is he perceived in all of his affairs of just regular life? Must be well thought of by outsiders so that he may not fall into disgrace into a snare of the devil. What we're going to talk this morning, I want to just do kind of three simple basic things. I want to talk about who pastors really are, pastor, elders, overseers, same thing, I'll show you in a minute, and kind of what do they do, but uh, also how do, we, how do we elect them? How do we choose them? How do we find out who they are and talk about some of their qualifications. Now you may be sitting there saying, Sean, I have no desire to be a pastor. I'm not a pastor, I'm not one, so what's this sermon gonna do for me this morning? What do you got for me? Well, I, I, a couple of things, all right? One, you need to go to a church that has leadership like this. This will help you know the kind of churches that you need to go to. There's a lot of churches out there and there's just really not that many that you should be thinking about going to. So number one, this will help you be discerning for the kind of church that you go to. Because guys, think about it this way. You choose your spouse. Outside of your spouse, the number two most important person that you are allowing and giving access into your life is who you select as your pastor. It's not, and when you go to a church, the number one decision is not what is their music, Number one decision is not, do they have great, cool music? Number one decision is not, do they have a nice driveway? <laughs> you know, do they have good things for my kids? The number one decision is, is who is the man that is called to shepherd me and to be my pastor that I'm going to give access into my life, and if you're married, access into my spouse's life, and if you have kids, access into my kid's life. You don't choose your parents. You, for the most part, don't choose your kids, and even then, you're really not giving them access to your heart as you should a pastor. So this is a big deal that we probably gloss over way too much. So first off, you should be thinking about that. 
Now, you're all in a church, or most of you are in a church, most of you are River of Lifers, so you should be looking at me saying, Sean, are you that pastor? Second reason, you ought to be praying, not just holding me accountable, but you ought to be praying that I can live this way and continue to live that way, all right? Second th reason why you ought to pay attention this morning, most of the stuff in this list are things you ought to be doing. And especially if you're a man. This is not old school like, oh, this guy's a priest or he's a minister. He's like, oh, living with God and angels, you know, and kind of not walking on the ground and in air. No, this is a list that we all should be striving for and stretching for and reaching toward. Men, you especially, whether you're single or not, is irrelevant. Whether you're married or not, whether you have kids or not, you should be stretching and living a life that matches these qualifications. This is a litmus test. This is a test of what God is expecting and wanting us to all how to live our life, all right? So even though Paul is talking about pastors and we're looking at it from a perspective of us as a church, I want you to process. Can you double channel process? I want you to think about your life and how this sinks in with you. And I'll work it both ways for you. So first thing I want you to recognize this morning as we look, who exactly are these pastors, these overseers, these, these elders, if you will? Look at 1 Peter 5. I want to show you something. There's a lot of terms that get called for pastors, you know. There's the old school kind of priest and father, if you will, and bishop and cardinals and all of that. And, uh, and then there's ministers and pastors and elders and, and all of those. And it can get very confusing pretty quickly about what the Bible actually talks about. Look at 1 Peter 5, not Acts 13. Go to 1 Peter 5, if you would. And look what Paul says in 1 Peter 5. He says, So I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder. The word elder here is synonymous with the word pastor. So Peter is writing to a, a church leaders who are elders. Now I want you to notice something. He says, I'm a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is to, going to be revealed. Now here's what he tells those elders to do. He says, shepherd the flock of God. That word shepherd is the word pastor. It's the exact same word. We use the word pastor, shepherd. It's absolutely interchangeable. So he's writing to elders. He tells them to be pastors. And he goes on. He says, shepherd the flock of God that's among you. And he tells them to exercise oversight. That's the word overseer that we just read in 1 Timothy 3.1. That word overseer is the word bishop. So bishop or overseer is the same as elder and actually is the same as it's where we get the word presbyter from. And that's where the denomination of Presbyterian actually comes from. Is the same as pastor. So when the Bible is talking about all three of these roles, they are not a hierarchy. They're actually one office, one individual. The Bible says that there's one office that's designed to lead and to shepherd, to oversee the church. And it can be called pastor, it can be called overseer or bishop, and it can be also called um, elder. They're the exact same thing. Look at Acts chapter 20 to, to show you. I'm giving you uh, just a little background here because to be honest with you, there's a lot of confusion out there. You know, he's a higher level pastor than this guy, and there's this arch minister, arch whatever, bishop, and this and that, and creating all these chains of command. And it's just not like that. The Bible doesn't give us like military, you know, with all of these roles. There's just, there's one. You're either a pastor, overseer, elder, or you're not. So in Acts chapter 20, Paul is writing... And significantly enough, he's writing, and, and he's, he's actually not writing, he's visiting the church at Ephesus. And in verse 17, the Bible says that now from Miletus, he sent to Ephesus, and he called the elders of the church to come to him. Jump then to verse 28. So he's talking to the elders again. These are the pastors, leaders in the church. And in verse 28, he says, he tells them, pay a, a careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock. There's that pastor kind of word again, right? The church is the flock of God. So your elders, and I want you to pay attention, care for the flock. In other words, I want you to be shepherds to that church, to the church that's in Ephesus, in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Shepherds, pastors, 
or, or elders, shepherd, pastor, overseers. Pay attention to that flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. God has given the church two offices. The, the first office that he's given, if you will, is that of the pastor, elder, bishop. You know, God purchased the church with his own blood, the blood of his son Jesus. It's significant. When the Bible talks about leadership of the church, he doesn't say, okay, pastors. He doesn't give the, them the title of owner. You know, the church is not owned by the pastors or the bishop, by their ministers or whoever the leaders is. He didn't give us the, the responsibility to be the, the owner or the head. There's one head of the church, and it's Jesus Christ. In fact, the church is owned by God himself. Look at that Acts chapter 20. The Bible says that God purchased, he obtained the church with his own blood. God himself, Jesus himself paid the price. God the Father purchased the church for himself. Donald Trump doesn't have enough money to pay for anything as high as this. There will never be a price paid for anything in the world ever again as, much, as valuable as the blood of Jesus. That is the highest price that could ever be paid for anything in the world around us. There's no sheik in the Middle East who's sitting on enough oil to control the world's oil to, make, to even begin to match, to even be in the same comparison of the value of the blood of the Son of God, the God of heaven, Jesus, who by his word created this world around us, who rules over everything, who was willing to, though he was God and infant and impure and full of life himself, to step out of heaven, as it were, and to put on humanity and to be willing to die in our place, to take upon him his sacrifice and his blood for our sins, to, that we might be saved from our sins. That's the absolute highest price that could be paid for anything. If we could buy the moon, it would be a lower price than what Jesus paid for you and for me to have a relationship with him. If we could, the universe could be purchased, it would be a lower price than what Jesus paid for you and for me. You see, there's only one person who owns the church. We belong to Jesus. It doesn't belong to me. It doesn't belong to any pastor, any elder, any overseer. We are not called owners. We are called shepherds. We are called overseers. We are caretakers, if you will, simply stewards of that which belongs to somebody else. Now, I don't know about you, but if I spend a lot of money for something and somebody else trashes it, I kind of get ticked off by that, don't you? I get a little bit offended. I, I kind of take care of stuff that I sacrificed and worked hard for to make happen and to buy. Jesus, God in heaven, cares more about the church than anybody. The church doesn't belong to any pastor or leader, but neither does the church belong to anybody sitting in the pews, in the chairs. Now, churches, we have a habit of beginning to take ownership. We do. It, it, I don't know why, outside of our own simple heart. It probably starts off early on. We care. We want things to go well. We want things to go right. And along the way, we begin to think that we're always right. And we don't realize it, but we begin to, begin to make ourselves little gods. And we think that we're in charge in God's gift and responsible to take care of everything. It's a healthy reminder for all of us to remember the church belongs to God. We belong to Him. We don't belong. Uh, we don't own it. This is not even our church. It's not my church. It's not fully really your church. It's God's church. He alone is the one who's the head. He is the alone that purchased us with the price of his blood. We belong to him. So what do pastors and overseers do? Well, if you look at that Acts 20, I actually go 1 Peter 5. Go back to 1 Peter 5. Paul in 1 Timothy 3 doesn't really tell us what pastors do so much. But 1 Peter tells us. He's writing to the elders and he tells us. He says in verse 2, Shepherd the flock of God that's among you, exercising oversight. So God tells the leader of the church, as we call them pastors or elders or whatever words we're going to call them, we're going to stick with pastors here because I think it's the simplest one word, right, so we don't confuse people 
I don't need, I have enough trouble with my scattered brain keeping it all in line. I don't need split multiple personalities thinking all of this stuff, right? That's the last thing I need. So we're just going to call our leaders pastors. And Paul, as he's writing to them, he tells, the, tells them, he says, your job is to shepherd. Think about what the role of a shepherd is to the sheep. The shepherd is to look out for the best interests of the sheep. In fact, a good shepherd is willing to face the, the, the wild animals and to face, fight off the wolves and all of that for the sake of the sheep. Shepherds feed the flock. They make sure that they have the food that they need when they're hungry. They make sure they have the water that they have when they're thirsty. They make sure that the parasites are taken care of. They're checking the animals, looking in their teeth and making sure everything's good. They're fighting off any of the enemies that would dare come harass them. They look out for the best interest of the sheep. That's what you want in a pastor, is it not? You want a pastor who's looking out for your soul. You want a pastor who's defending your soul against the, the lions, the enemy of God, Satan. You're wanting a, a pastor who is willing to shepherd you, who's willing to guide you and tend you and care for you, nurture you, grow you, feed you, and to, to take care of you along the way. Yes, you need to do that yourself. Yes, you need to pray. Yes, you need to read your Bible. and need to be growing. Uh, this is not uh, church daycare, right? This is not that kind of scenario. But nonetheless, God calls leaders to look out for the interest of the sheep. You want to know that you have a pastor, do you not, that's praying for you. That when you're facing challenging times, that you know that you've got somebody, not just God himself, Jesus himself is praying for you, but you also have a pastor that's praying for you. You want to know that if you're beginning to move in a direction that is not honoring to God, or that's actually harmful to you or destructive to your, your marriage, if you're married or challenging, whatever, you want to know that you've got a pastor that's going to speak up who is not, uh, not a fighter, who is not a quarreler, and as the Bible talks about, but you've got somebody who's watching out for you. That's the kind of church that you need to be a part of. Not a church that has just somebody who's a great communicator, has great music, who has this or that or all the bells and whistles, right? But somebody who's truly going to shepherd the flock. That's what pastors do. They're the shepherd. Second thing I want you to recognize, not only is there, are, are we called to be the elders, that's kind of, when the Bible describes pastors as elders, it means they should be wise, mature, not that they should have a position and sit there, you know, and okay, I'm the elder, I'm in charge, but there to be a, a level of maturity, a stability. There should be a, a, a level of experience of life there that you look to them and say, they know what they're talking about. They should sh feed in the church and, and take care of the church as a shepherd. They should oversee the church in terms of being the leader. They ought to be able to look out past what's in front of the church and what's going on. They should be overseers, not dictators, not autocrats but truly leading and leading together with the body. It's on them to do that. Well, the second thing I want you to, to notice is not just who they are, but how do, how do we elect them? What does the Bible say? How does somebody become an overseer? Well, look what Paul says in, verse, in chapter 3, verse 1. He says, this is trustworthy. You can bank on it. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, aspires... He desires a noble task, a good work. The Bible describes somebody becoming a pastor shepherd who has that desire in their heart. They aspire. They want to reach out to become something that they are not already. Sean, do you mean anybody that just wants to become a pastor can become a pastor? Uh, no, that's not really what the Bible teaches. In fact, what the Bible teaches is that God calls pastors. We as a church are to confirm them as pastors, but usually it starts with a guy sticking his hand up saying, hey, I'm kind of interested in that. I think God might be doing something. I kind of want to do that. Notice what in Acts chapter 13. Do you remember the story when Paul and Barnabas are sent out from the first church in Antioch? Paul and Barnabas are sent out and uh, ch Acts chapter 13, verse 1, the Bible says, Now there were in the church at Antioch 
prophets and teachers, and it names them Barnabas, Simeon, Niger, Lucius of, the Cyrene, of Cyrene, Manin, a member of uh, the, uh, the court of Herod, the Tetrarch, and Saul. And while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart from me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. When God wants to get something done through His ministers, if you will, God, the Holy Spirit, bears witness and puts His finger on a man, or men in this case, and says, I've got a job for you to do. I'll tell you a secret. My kids don't always like when I come to them and say, I've got a job for you. <laughs> Did you like that when you were growing up? Mom comes to you, I got a job for you. You're like, oh, great. <laughs> right? And pretty soon you learn not to even roll your eyes because then it kind of doubled. Oh, yeah? Well, let me give you a little more to add to that, right? Well, the funny thing is, is God does have a job for us to do. But it's a job that is work, and it's a job that's a blessing, and it's called pastoring, and it's called ministering, it's called leading His church. You see, God's plan in this world, His, his first plan, His A game, His plan A, is that the church would be the church, leading the, the gospel force into the world around us, sharing the gospel, living the good news of Jesus Christ, bringing the life change to people's lives, helping them to know the Savior that even though they're messed up and screwed up, even though that they're battling all this stuff they don't understand and they're experiencing the shame in their life because of sin and, and that, that God in heaven has reached down and wants them to have a relationship with Him and to save them. God wants the church to be the uh, driving force for that in the world around us. And so, uh, he, and to do that well, He has two offices, pastors, and the other one I haven't talked about so much is deacons. I'm going to let Dan talk about that in a couple of weeks. The pastors, elders, overseers are to, to servant lead the church, to lead out. The deacons are really, the word literally deacon means to be a, a servant, to, to serve. They're the ones to be serve the needs in the body, to take care of the body. Not so much from a leadership point, but more from a servant point. And so God wants the church to do well, and He's given both of those entities to the church to be a gift to the church to accomplish His purposes in the world. He puts His hand down on somebody's life. And when God puts... When God calls somebody to something, He usually stirs in their heart that they want to do that. Maybe not right at first. In fact, usually what I find out is people get scared when they feel like God wants them to do something. You know, when mom and dad want you to do something, usually you're like, oh, I really just wanted to watch Saturday morning cartoons today, mom. You know, or whatever your thing was, right? I wanted to just sleep in. I did not want to get up and mow the lawn and paint today. I'm sorry. But when God puts His finger on you, you know what I've noticed in people's lives? It's usually fear. I can't do that. Whoa, I, 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 I'm scared. You know why? Because God always calls us to do something that we have to do in His strength and not in ours. Always, 100% of the time. Why? Because if He called us to do something that we do in our strength, then we really think that we're great and really the things that we end up doing are pretty pitiful. <laughs> God wants us to do stuff that's a little bit bigger than that. He wants us to do stuff that only He can do, and He wants it to do it through people who are average and ordinary and who are honestly fairly weak. So He always calls us to do more. Look at what God did with Moses. Moses, I'm going to send you back to Egypt and lead out my people. Oh, I can't do that. I'm not a good speaker, and he gives all these excuses. Most often when God puts His finger on a man, we take two steps back. Even as pastors, are like, I can't do that. And God says, oh, yes, you can. In Christ, all things are possible. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So God puts his hand down. He calls a man. They begin to get a desire in their heart. And as that then becomes public and begins to bubble, other people begin to notice along the way. Wow, there seems to be something stirring in that guy's heart. Did you hear? Did you see? Yeah, I noticed that too. And as that begins to become public, what is going on is the Holy Spirit is bearing witness in other people's lives around that individual saying, yep, he's the guy. He's the one that should be doing this. See, God always, when he calls, he always bears witness 
to the people around that person, particularly in the church. When God called Paul and Barnabas, he could have just supernaturally spoken to Paul and Barnabas, said, hey, I want you to go someplace, but God didn't do that. God did it in the context of the church. He said to the church, send those two out. So when we move forward in September, what we're praying for, we're asking the God of heaven to speak into people's lives, to call them to help lead his church, specifically River. And as God puts his hand down and settles onto their heart, we're expecting that God will be stirring in their own life a desire to want to do that. And I'm looking as a pastor to see where God is bearing witness in our congregation that that is so. You see, that's the way it gets protected. Just because somebody throws their hand up and says, I want to be a pastor, doesn't mean they should be a pastor. I read recently of the story of a person, a very popular TV preacher. If I said the person's name, you, you would actually know, uh, you would know this person. And in uh, and, and listening to this person, she, or listening to her story, she just said, you know, I just really realized I saw the guy up there and I just really wanted to do that. I want to do that. I couldn't get away from it. Just so it was obviously that God wanted me to be a, be a pastor, be a preacher. And so she became a pastor preacher. The problem is, though, as we talked about last week, is that God reserves this office for men. And the church did not confirm well with her. And the church should have said, ma'am, I think you are called to be a phenomenal speaker. But you're called to be a phenomenal speaker to women and not to be a pastor of a church. It's a slightly different calling. You see, the church is the one, this is the way this works. God the Holy Spirit works, but God the Holy Spirit never just speaks to one person. You and I do not bow just to one person's wish or design in the church. It's not the way it works. Just because God, somebody, somebody comes to you and says, God told me, doesn't mean that God told them anything. It could have been their messed up Fruit Loops for breakfast. They had bad milk and didn't know it. And they just get this little... Stirring in their heart. It could be, they could be having some little selfish thing. The enemy could be putting something into their brain wanting to do something. And they think it's God and it's not. The protection and ultimately is the church body gets before God. And when where there's two or three of us gathered together and more than that, and we're praying in that season of prayer, then we bear witness. At the end of the day, we don't call that person to be a pastor. We just confirm that God has already called them, and we kind of sanction it on this earth, if you will. And we help them move forward. So we're going to enter into that time in September, and I'm going to be asking you guys to enter into a time of special prayer at home alone. We maybe even have a special time for us as a church. And asking for God to put individual names on, your, on people's hearts that they would like to consider to become lay pastors of our church to join with me to help us lead into our future. And then when that person comes on your heart, the next step you're going to do is you're going to go talk to that person. You're going to pray with them. And if that person prays through it and is like, yeah, I don't really think God's in that. I don't want to do that. Then God's obviously not calling them and that's fine, right? And those that confirm that, then you're going to recommend to, to me ultimately as, as a pastor and we're going to look through those names and then we're going to begin to sit down with those individuals behind the scenes and quietly because, you know, the last thing that we want is 10 people being, you know, names up here and, and having some who want to and don't want to and this be all confusing. But I'm going to sit down with each of those individuals and with their wives who are interested and we're going to pray through and consider. And at the end of the day, and as they get examined, and we're going to ask some other churches, pastors, to help examine them with us, their qualifications. And then at the end of the day, those individuals that pass all the qualifications that want to be pastors and that have been recognized by the body, we're going to put them forward to the church. And we as a church are going to pray for that and confirm that. And then we will set them apart as pastors, seeing that God has called them. I'll lead you through that. You won't probably remember half of that. But that's how pastors are chosen. Guys, some of you need to seriously consider being late, becoming pastors. You've probably never thought about it. Moms and dads, here's the thing. When God is not calling out pastors of a church or out of the churches of an area, it means that God is removing his hand of blessing from that region. It means that God is beginning to become quiet. 
Because God always works through the church. How, how are churches going to be started? How are churches going to thrive? How is God's kingdom going to push forward when it, it's through the church when there are not pastors to take on that next generation and to lead? It's something that we as a church should be praying for and should be looking for. Mom and dad, it's something that we should actually be praying for and even challenging our own kids, our own boys to say, don't miss if God is speaking to you what he may be doing. You know what we tend to do? We tend to fixate, well, you've got to go out and get a good job. You need to become an engineer or a doctor or whatever your thing is, right? Or go do this and go do that. Well, God wants to call out people. Some of you young men need to consider that God may call you out into ministry. God may have that for you. And the first step for you is just say, God, if that's what you want me to do, I'm willing. That's what you did when you got saved. You wrote your name on a blank check and said, God, I just trust you to save me and to be Lord of my life. Whatever you want to do with me, I'm yours. But somewhere along the way, we begin to limit how much. God needs to call out pastors. I would love a dozen pastors to be called out of our church in the years ahead. I didn't put that on the 2020 visions. I didn't sense God leading us for that, but I would love that. Third thing, that's who pastors are. That's how they're called. God calls them, we have a desire, the men have a desire, and the church confirms them, ordains them, ultimately sets them aside, and we'll walk through that process. It'll be orderly, and, and it'll, make, it'll be clear, and we as a whole church will know that God has spoken through us. Well, what are the qualifications for pastor? That's really what 1 Timothy is talking about here. What are the qualifications? Just like you think about getting a new job, what are the qualifications? Am I qualified or not? Well, I read you a laundry list of things. No, nope, we're not going to walk through that whole list today. Good news. <laughs> I saved my, most of that, if not all of that, for next week. But let me observe a few things here. Did you notice as I was looking through that list, we were working through it a minute ago, that they're to be above reproach. That's really the big one. But there's all these other things. Husband and one wife, sober-minded. They're to be wise and just, you know, alert and aware. Not confused, not easily distracted uh, is what that means. Self-controlled, respectable. By the way, ladies thinking about marriage in the future, this is the kind of guy you need to marry. This is the kind of person that you need to, to marry. This would be a great on a qualification list. Self, somebody with self-control, respectable, hospitable. Uh, they don't have to be able to teach or not. I want you to notice that all of these on this list, most all of them, involve character. Character. You see, the first and foremost quality is not that somebody has gone to seminary, is smart, definitely not somebody who's good looking or I'd be out of this a long time ago, not somebody that has all kinds of things. The number one quality that we should be looking for is character. The person should be above reproach. That word above reproach means that they are to be above criticism. It literally means that they are beyond being arrested. Right? In law enforcement, if there's probable cause, you can search a car and all those kinds of things and you get arrested. And It's not the officer's job to decide if you're guilty or not. That's a whole other uh, system that's responsible for that for the courts. Their job is to say, there's reason well enough, uh, I've got reason enough to arrest you here with what you've done. And they write it up in their reports and it goes before an legal proceeding. This above reproach literally means no, you are beyond arrest. There's nothing that anybody can accuse you of, criticize you about, that can take you into custody. You're above that. You are squeaky clean in every area of your life. And it's an extensive area. That's what the rest of these things are about. We'll talk about those next week because they will challenge us in our own life. But above reproach, if you're married in a marriage relationship, above reproach in your family, above reproach in relationship to money, above reproach in relationship to how you live and your own self-control, can you manage yourself? Above reproach in all of your business and living dealings out there in the world around us. Everything literally from your, you know, uh, how you treat your kids in the school system to how you are at their games to how you are at the store above reproach that nobody can lay anything at your feet and say you are messed up man it's character is what we're after the number one thing it's significant being able to teach is on the list but what happens when somebody is a good teacher but doesn't have character they begin to they fall into moral failure do they not that's when they get all kinds of trouble. 
somebody who's a great, gifted, golden tongue, golden mouth, you know, able to speak, and wow, it's wonderful. But behind the scenes, not a person of integrity, not a person of character, and it'll eventually come out. Satan will make sure of it. In fact, Satan will allow guys who are gifted speakers to get up high, and then he takes their knees out. Because when they fall and they're popular, they make a bigger splash. Little trees don't make much noise when they fall. Big trees, when they fall, it, sh it rattles the earth and everything moves. And Satan is happy either way. So it's character, and we'll talk about that. Second thing I want you to recognize with these, these are, um, these ultimately are issues that even, they, they primarily play out and are real after we know Jesus. You and I, before we knew Christ, did not live up to this list. It's still a challenge. Can we be honest? Not a lover of money? I don't, I'm really not trying to become a millionaire, but it's pretty easy for me to lust after a $20 item <laughs> without even realizing it. Like, oh, I'd really like to have that. Ooh, I probably ought not like that that much. <laughs> pretty easy. Pretty easy to, to have a fit of anger Pretty easy to uh, lose control. Pretty easy to not be respectable in a moment. Pretty easy to not be hospitable. I'm just tired. I don't want to deal with that person. Pretty easy to mess these up. So most of these, this is about life change. What it's saying is, is that God saves us and He changes our life. And we begin to live that way. You're looking, we're looking for men that obviously have the mark of God's hand in their life that has changed their life. That's what we're looking for. But their life before Jesus does come into play. Let's think about this. God changes them, right? So you may have been one thing on this list. You may have been somebody that loved to get drunk and loved your alcohol before you knew Jesus. And after that, no, you're not getting drunk. Life has changed. But there at least needs to be enough distance between that old way of life and that new way of life that everybody around you knows you're different. That takes time. That takes a changed life. You can't just turn on a dime and become qualified to be able to be a pastor. Well, I'm not like that anymore. That's true, you're not, but your reputation is out there. And in some instances, things that we do before we get saved tend to have a long reach into our saved life. I'll give you an example. When the Bible says here that the person must be well thought of by outsiders, in verse 7, so they may not fall into disgrace, I'm not sure that I could ever be comfortable with us bringing somebody forward who was on a sex offender list, just to pick an easier one, right? Somebody that's on a registry somewhere they're not going to be well thought of by the world. Their name is out there. Somebody who is a child molester, can they be saved? Absolutely. Can Jesus change their life? Absolutely. Can that be all in the past? Absolutely. But what God is looking for are men whose lives are bulletproof. And sometimes our life before Jesus is so messed up that it takes a little while for it to get cleaned up. And for there to be a, enough of a break that people are like, man, I don't know who that person is now, but wow, they are different from before. But there can still be a few little things that hang over that do affect us in our new life. So as we think about this list, the reason this whole bulletproof thing is, we look at this so strange and so messed up as people. Here's, here's what we tend to think. I'm not good enough. Why can't I? Why can't I ought to be able to be considered? Right? We, we take it that way. Am I not? That's the way we live everywhere in life. No, that's not the issue. The issue is that God would never want anything in an individual's life to come up and surface and to bring shame or even doubt upon his church. He purchased it in his blood, guys. He is way above and beyond what any individual's thoughts or whims should be like. This is not about self and ego. Well, why can't I be? No, this is not about being good enough. This is just about simply, has God called us or not? 
So people who are pastors and the people that we will be looking and considering, I pray and trust, they're not better than anybody else. They're just simply people that God is calling forward to lead his church. The amazing thing with Jesus is that there's level ground at the cross. We're all sinners saved by grace. Nobody is better or worse than the others. We're all messed up. We're all jacked up. We all get that. But even so, our lifestyle, even before Jesus, does matter in how this plays out. So we're looking for men who have clearly experienced a life change. There is an after Jesus kind of picture and enough time has gone by that even people outside of them, their church, even outside of their world says, that guy is different. So think about it this way. Maybe you were a compulsive liar before you knew Jesus. Jesus saved you and forgave you of all of that. After you know Jesus, you know what? It's a good thing to go back and to say, I'm sorry, to get some of that right. Maybe you stole a million dollars. I'm being facetious, but maybe you stole a million dollars and you're living large and you know Jesus and you're saved, your heart's right, you're a godly person. You still need to go back and kind of make that right at whatever level. So even after you're saved and forgiven, God forgives you, loves you, there's some, you, you don't need to go back and fix things to earn your way to heaven or to kind of make God, you know, to make it all right, if you will. But you need to go back and to own some of that because that's what God is going to use to change your life. Do you go back and try to say you're sorry so you can be a good reputation and make people think good things of you? No. You go back and make it right because it's the right thing to do. And as you do those things, God begins changing you even more, and there's even more of a break between your past and where you are today. I don't know if that makes sense or not, but as we consider the future, the, man that God, the men that God is calling out, whether it's pastoring in our church, my prayer is that in September God will surface those men for our church. My prayer is even after September that God will call out men that he will send in other places. I just, that's the kind of church we need to be, that are leading people to Jesus, teaching people to follow Jesus, equipping and calling out and sending. We're looking for those men with a before and after story that God has just got his hand upon them and changed their life and the whole world knows it and they're bulletproof. No accusation, no integrity issues, their wife knows everything's cool, their kids know everything's cool, their family knows everything cool, their neighbor knows it, their co-workers, their boss knows it, we know it, everybody sees a change in their life. Those are the men that God wants. So where are you this morning? What is your before and after story with Jesus? Maybe you haven't received Jesus as Lord of your life yet. Maybe you haven't realized that he purchased you, purchased your salvation with his blood. Our team is going to come up and lead us in a song. And this is kind of our time of reflection. We try to make it as much as possible a time that if, if God is speaking into your heart, to give you a little bit of time to think and reflect, to consider and ponder, maybe, maybe some of you have never thought, you know, I've never thought about even being a pastor before. I've never thought about what they do. Maybe you need to, in this time, just say, God, I don't feel called to that, but I'm willing. Maybe you usher that prayer. Maybe your prayer is, God, I didn't know that I needed to be saved, that I needed to simply trust Jesus, that Jesus paid everything for me. Trust Him as Lord of your life and Savior of your life. Maybe you haven't been living a life of integrity and God convicted your heart with something there. Maybe you began taking more ownership of a church, of this church or another church than you should have. I, I don't know what God has spoken to your heart, but I know this. Whatever's in your heart this morning, do business with Him. Respond to Him.